You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel, the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. You're watching a Bible answer dedicated to answering your questions from the Word of God. We're glad you're watching today. Tell other people about the program, won't you? We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. They're serving as our panelists. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Good morning, I'm Sidney White, minister for the Gardner Church of Christ in Martin, Tennessee. My name is Tim Howard, the minister of the Sanford Church of Christ in the Missouri Boot Hill near the town of Steele. Hello, I am Steve Sanders from Donovan, Missouri. I am the minister for the Donovan Church of Christ. We're glad that each of these brethren could be with us today. Our first question goes to Brother Howard. And the person asks, why is the book of Song of Solomon in the Bible, Brother Howard? Well, that's a good question. And my answer would be that every book that is in the book, the Bible, is there for a reason. Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So that all Scripture, everything that's in the Bible is, is profitable, is good for us. Solomon, who wrote Song of Solomon, is known for his wisdom literature, the book of Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, but Solomon also wrote over 1,000 songs, as 1 Kings 4.32 tells us. But only a few of those are in the Bible. Psalm 72 and Psalm 127 are two. The Song of Solomon, or in the Greek, Song of Songs, indicates that this song might have been the most beautiful of all other songs, the loveliest of songs, as it were. Chapter 2, verse 4, He brought me to the banqueting house, and His banner over me was love. Beautiful thoughts like that, that we hear in this particular book. Ecclesiastes focuses on the intellect of man. Song of Solomon is more about the emotions of man, and specifically marital love. Portions of Solomon, Song of Solomon rather, along with other scriptures, were sung on the eighth day of the Passover feast. It is said that they liken Proverbs to the outer court of the temple, Ecclesiastes to the holy place, and the Song of Solomon to the most holy place. As Jensen put it, the book is a unified lyrical poem. It is a series of stanzas or songs of varied lengths. We might say that it's an ancient Cinderella story uh, in, uh, in the Bible. But we need to realize for our purposes that Song of Solomon promotes sexual purity both in and out of marriage. It suggests that all life, including human sexuality, is holy because God has created it. In the New King James uh, study Bible, I think, puts it pretty, pretty well. It says, The Song of Solomon celebrates the beauty and intimacy of married love in a narrative poem. It teaches that a lasting marriage requires dedication, commitment, and strong loyalty between husband and wife. The song also presents an idealized picture of how human love can be expressed under God's blessing. Some critics have claimed that Christianity's standards for marriage ignore or undervalue sexual relationships. But the Song of Solomon refutes this. It reiterates the biblical admonition against sex outside of marriage. Chapter 2, verse 7, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. But it also affirms that God not only approves of, but also encourages sexual pleasure within marriage. Now, there are many people that see an allegory representing the love of God and relationship between God and man, whether it be God and Israel of old or Christ and the church, as Ephesians 5 points out. And that those might be used as a principle or an idea that we might gain from that particular story or illustration. And, and that should cause us a more genuine love for the Lord and a deeper gratitude for His love for us. But... The story itself is real. The story itself tells us or about love between a husband and a wife. James 1.17 says that every good gift is from God. And that includes love, literature, and relationships. 
including sexual intimacy within marriage. Chapter 2, verse 16, My beloved is mine, and I am his. Song of Solomon expresses unrestricted joy in a relationship of love. The world talks about having safe sex and all the dangers that are, that are uh, associated with immoral relationships. And I think Song of Solomon proudly says, if you follow God's way, you don't have to worry about that. God's marriage, God's uh, sexual relationship within marriage between a husband and wife is the, is the best way, the only way that God wants us to, to live. As again Jensen says, the book's literal message is perverted only by those who do not see the purity and true beauty of all of God's creative acts. Hopefully this will help in, in that and hopefully we'll study the book even more to, uh, to strengthen our marriages in life. Thank you for that good question. Thank you. I once had to do a manuscript on the first uh, two chapters of the book of Song of Solomon and one of the things I remember I pointed out was the communication that they expressed in that couple and uh, what a good example it is for us how personal and uh, and uh, proportionate and in every way their communication was with one another and how it would help us to facilitate communication with our spouse. Now to Brother Sanders. Did Jesus appear in different bodies after His resurrection? And they cite Mark 16, verse 12. Brother Sanders. Thank you for this question. In Mark 16, 12, it says, After that He appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. Now this is talking about Jesus after His resurrection. He did appear to these two men and it says that it was in another form. Now <clears throat> you may want to notice Luke's account of this same incident. As a matter of fact in Luke 16 or 24, 16, Luke records, but their eyes were holden that they should not know Him. You know it's been said very correctly I might say that the Bible is its own best commentary. And that old saying is borne out in a, this particular study. Now if we look at Mark's account and look at Luke's account and put them together, it makes it very easy to understand what is being said here. In Mark's account we find the phrase that he appeared in another form. That word appeared comes from, uh, it just simply means to make known or to reveal. Where the word form in this passage comes from the Greek word morphos and it simply means form or appearance. And so it has to do with the way something appears. But when we look at that in light of what Luke had to say concerning this, he used that phrase, their eyes were holden or restrained is another word that can be used there. Eyes of course uh, just means their eyes but then you have that word holden which, uh, which comes from the Greek krato, or krateo and that means to grasp or to take possession. Some translations actually use the word restrained in this particular passage. So taken together Mark and Luke's accounts give us a good understanding of, of what happened here. Uh, first of all, Mark says that Jesus appeared to these two men in another form. It, it was not another body, it was another kind of appearance. They appeared, He appeared in a different way to them. Second, Luke explains that Jesus had uh, restrained their eyes in some sense. Their eyes were holden is what it says there. So in some sense He, was, he miraculously uh, controlled their eyes so that they did not recognize who He was. So this passage does not teach that Jesus used different bodies but rather this was an act on what these men saw. Thank you for your question. Thank you, and now we have this question to Brother White. Do you believe the rapture will occur after the tribulation and before the thousand year reign of Christ on earth called the millennium? Brother White. That's a very good question. It's about a 16 week study, but we'll try to answer it in about two or three minutes here. 
uh, in a very brief way, and hopefully it will uh, cause you to do some further study on your own. You, you may have been riding down the road and, and see a bumper sticker that says, in case of the rapture, this car will be vacated, or a question, will I see you in the rapture? Those are common things that, that we often see. When we define the word rapture, uh, we first note that the word doesn't appear in the Scriptures. And that being the case, at least in a reliable translation, we cannot define the word biblically speaking because it doesn't appear. When we use the American Collegiate Dictionary, it defines rapture as ecstatic joy or delight, joyful ecstasy, utterance or expression of ecstatic delight. And so there are senses in which this word can accurately be used. But when we look at the way it is used re with reference to this question, obviously this comes out of the, the premillennial background thinking, and as every other false religion in the world, they have to have their own definitions of words. They cannot use the ones that are to be found in the Scriptures. But according to premillennialism, the idea is a time when the Lord will, will come, take His people somewhere in the air, for a period of seven years. This, of course, is not a biblical doctrine. It doesn't harmonize, but rather contradicts the teachings of the Scriptures in that regard. Jesus will come, and the saints will be caught up to meet the Lord. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes, in trying to encourage brethren in Thessalonica, that we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not just seven years, but so shall we ever be with the Lord. There is going to be a resurrection. There is going to be a coming of the Lord. But according to premillennialism and the rapture concept, He's going to have to come three or four times, which the Bible does not uphold in that regard. In John chapter 5, Verses 28 and 29, John simply records, marvel not, the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Nowhere talks about a resurrection of the righteous separate and apart from the wicked or vice versa, as premillennialism would have us believe. But the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear His voice and, in, and come forth. It's also interesting to note when we study the premillennial doctrine that they suggest to us that this coming of the Lord is going to be a silent coming, that only those who are caught up to meet the Lord for this, quote, seven-year period are the only ones that will know anything about it. And yet when I read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, to me, verse 16, is, as I often refer to it, one of the nauseous verses in the Bible. No, by no way is there a silence indicated. It, it, it talks about a shout. It talks about the voice of the archangel. It talks about the trump of God. None of that sounds silent to me in that regard. And then when you look at Peter's account of things, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3 in that regard, uh, at the end of time, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat, Obviously, everybody's going to be involved in that. Folks are going to know about that. And so, when we look at this question in a general way, the Bible does not, does not teach the concept of a rapture as taught by premillennialism. Now, the matter of the, the tribulation that's mentioned in this question and the matter of the thousand-year reign of Christ in this question are subjects for a different time that could be answered on the program, but, but as far as the rapture is concerned, it is certainly not a biblical doctrine and thus cannot be answered according to the Scriptures. But again, hopefully you'll do further study in this matter. And thank you again for that question. Thank you very much for that good answer. And now we've reached the halfway point of our program today. And we want to offer you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled, Learning to Listen May Save Your Marriage. If you'd like to have this tract or an eight-lesson Bible correspondence course or both, or to send us your question, just contact us. That address is Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 
38024. You can email us your request or your question at a Bible answer at earthlink.net. You can call our toll free number, and if you get our answer machine, please leave your address in a good, clear voice so that we may meet your request for these free materials. And that number is 1 800 436 0463. You may also reach us by means of our contact page on our website. That address is www.abibleanswertb.org. Now back to our questions today. We have this question for Brother Howard. What are some of the different names for God and what do they mean? Brother Howard. Well, this too is one of those questions that you could probably spend a good 16 weeks studying, but I'll do my best to just run through some of these names uh, quickly and give you a verse or two and maybe you can do some study on your own. Uh, there are a number of names of God, both Old and New Testament, and each has defining characteristics. For example, the term Yahweh or Jehovah means the self-existent one. It is the, per the personal and proper name for God. Genesis 12, 8, uh, Psalm 68, 4, and others give that one. There are some subnames, I guess, for lack of a better term, that we could use for Yahweh. And my apologies to the Hebrew language here. Uh, Yahweh Yira. Uh, Yahweh will provide, Genesis 22, 8 and following. Yahweh Nisi. Yahweh is my banner, Exodus 17, 15. Yahweh Shalom. Yahweh is peace, Judges 6, 24. Uh, Yahweh Sabbath. Yahweh of hosts or armies, 1 Samuel 1, verse 3. Yahweh Ra. Yahweh is my shepherd, the 23rd Psalm, verse 1. And then Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh the Mighty One, Isaiah 17, verse 6. Another term for God is Adonai, which means Lord and Master. This is the name of God that was used when Yahweh, the proper name of God, came to be thought of by the Jewish individuals as too sacred to pronounce, Exodus 4, 10 and following, and Joshua 7, verse 8 and following. Another term we've referenced a little bit is Elohim, the Mighty One. This is the plural term for God, Genesis chapter 1. And it says, let us, plural, make man in our image, plural. Uh, referencing to the Godhead of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are also some sub-terms for this. El Elyon, Most High, Genesis 14, 18. El Roy, the Mighty One who sees, Genesis 16, verse 13. El Shaddai, this was a popular song a few years ago. Almighty God, or all-sufficient God, Genesis 17. El Olam, everlasting God, or God of eternity, Genesis 21, 33. El Elohi Israel, God, the God of Israel, Genesis 33. And then there are some that I suppose we are a little more familiar with as far as the New Testament goes. There is Yeshua, which is a term for Jesus. Yahweh is Savior or Salvation, Matthew 16. Another term that's used in that same passage is Christos, which means Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Now Yeshua, my understanding, is another term for, for Joshua, which is another term for Jesus, which is fairly common throughout the Bible. So Joshua, Joshua or Jesus was the, the, the common name for Jesus, but Christ, only He wore that. That was the title. He was and is the Messiah, the Anointed One. There is Kurios, which is Lord and Master, Luke 1.45. And then there's Soter, which means Savior, one who delivers from danger and death, Luke 1.47. And then finally there's a, a larger, broader term, Theos, which means God, which is a, a class noun that can refer to any God or to the one true God. And this is used of the Lord Jesus as the one true God, Luke 1, 47 and Titus 2, verse 13. Again, there are a lot of terms, a lot of uh, descriptions. Uh, these terms are descriptive, rather, these names are, about God. And this shows His greatness, His power, His might, and how truly wonderful He is. And so hopefully this will help you in your personal study of the names and characteristics of God. Thank you. And now to Brother Sanders. This question, and it's a good one. How can I overcome sin in my Christian life? Brother Sanders. As you said, this is a great question and I truly appreciate the person who asked this because it just shows how conscientious you are in living the Christian life. I wish more people were this conscientious and cared enough about the, having this same goal in their life. 
In 1 John 5, verses 3 and 4, John wrote, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so faith is what helps us to overcome the world and worldliness, sin, in fact. But faith and keeping His commandments go hand in hand. They cannot be separated, actually. And that's one of the reasons you have this in that I wanted to include verse 3 in the context. Because, as Paul put it in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the first thing is that we need to understand the connection between faith and obedience, the relationship that exists there. And if I were to give you, I realize this question is not about that. This question is actually asking, how can I overcome sin? We're talking about practical advice to help us to overcome and deal with temptation in our daily lives. And so the first thing that I would say, based on what we read in 1 John 5, 3, is to find the joy in obeying God and in living the Christian life. Because once these commands become grievous in our lives, that is burdensome in our lives, it can discourage us and distract us from living that life. And so look for the joy. Find that happiness. And that's something that we must determine to do. But a second thing would be to avoid sin. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul tells Timothy to flee youthful lust but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And when he says flee youthful lust, Paul is not talking about those temptations or lust that appeal to those who are youthful or those who are young. But rather, he's saying flee from those lusts while the lusts themselves are youthful. It's like that old saying, nip it in the bud. You, you want to get away from that temptation before it has grown to the point that it has more power over you and it becomes more difficult to overcome. So as soon as that temptation starts, you want to avoid that. We also find this principle in passages like Psalm 1-1 where David said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And there you see a progression uh, of, of uh, what he is saying here when he talks about walking and he talks about uh, and furthermore standing or sitting in the seat of the scornful. So we need to avoid that sin. But right after Paul, or David wrote this in Psalm 1-1, in the very next verse, he said something else. He said, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And so that brings us to another bit of practical advice in overcoming sin, and that is to make God's Word a part of our life. Uh, actually, it might be better to say, don't make it a part of your life, make it your life. Because if we make it a part of our life, it's as if we're dissecting our lives into home and family, church, that type of thing. Our spiritual life permeates every aspect of our life. As the, as the psalmist said in Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So we have to get the word of God, get into the word of God, and then get the word of God into us. Another thing is we need to stay on guard against sin because we can slip at times. And it's something we need to be aware of. Paul reminded the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And then finally we need to realize that if we fall we need to get right back up. That is something that can happen. You know, in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, Paul said, uh, tells us that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. Discouragement is one of Satan's 
greatest tools. It's one of his most powerful tools. And when we get down, sometimes we think, what's the use? But if we get right back up and start going again, we can overcome that sin. You know, the Bible is full of examples of great people who did fall. Some of the most, some of the heroes of the faith are people who fell. They stumbled, but they didn't let that keep them down. They got up and kept going. There's so much more that could be said concerning this, but time simply does not permit it. I just hope that we will remember the words of Jesus in Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Again, I want to thank you for this wonderful question. Thank you very much to each of these brethren for doing such a great job today in answering these questions on a Bible answer. We want to remind you that a Bible answer is now on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. If you have uh, access to that channel on satellite, you can watch a Bible answer each Saturday evening at 6.30 and then again on Thursday afternoon at 3.30. Uh, in the afternoon. We are appreciative to all those also that watch us on the internet as well as on WQWQ, the Heartland CW at 8 o'clock on each Sunday morning. Also on uh, WJKT, Fox 16, Jackson, Tennessee at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. And then on our newest channel, WBBJ TV, CBS, and that is at 7 o'clock on Sunday morning. So uh, there are those in the Jackson area that sometimes watch us at 7 o'clock. I had one man say, you know, I saw you at 7 and I enjoyed it so much I watched it again at 8. So if you live in that reason, in that region, you have the opportunity to see us even more than once on Sunday morning. Do tell other people about where a Bible answer can be seen in your area and encourage people to watch this program. If you have a Bible question, we encourage you to send it in. You may have a question that's arisen based on the questions that we've answered uh, today, a follow-up question. Be sure and send that in to us. And uh, there is sometimes a little delay. We uh, do have captioning and other things going on that take some time in our schedule, but we'll get right to it. Thanks so much for watching a Bible Answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible Answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.